this very, very special guest, Lori Ajax. Thank you for being here. So usually uh, there's a, a long intro, and I'm going to skip that because everyone knows who Lori is. But what I wanted to do is just share some thoughts on how we came about this panel. Uh, so we sent out a survey to licensed cannabis operators. Uh, thank you for those of you that filled it out. I appreciate it. And from those questions, uh, we distilled down a lot of concerns, uh, a lot of anxiety, a lot of fear, a lot of hope, a lot of, a lot of everything. And we've done our best to uh, consolidate it into these questions that we're gonna uh, go one-on-one uh, -on -one with Lori. I think being a public servant is pretty uh, thankless sometimes and tireless. And uh, we had some comments, I'd love to share them with you. Uh, good work. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Keep up the great work. You are doing the best with the hand that you are dealt. Please remember too many good ideas can be a bad idea. I think with enormous task at hand, you're doing a great job. You folks are extremely responsive and frankly, it's a pleasure dealing with you. Yeah. Thank you, job well done. This is a great start. Despite all the hurdles, the BCC is really doing its best to accommodate everyone. Thank you for listening to us and thank you for your hard work. Wow. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's really, really important. Um, cool, so we're gonna get this thing started here. So uh, it's hard to be a public servant. We've seen the regulators beset on all sides by clamoring voices and interests. To whom are you ultimately responsible? You've been through a lot and learned a lot these last couple of years. Looking back, what, if anything, would you do differently? Well, I, can, I, can I at least start off and say I've, I've got a couple of staff members here, Natasha and Andre, way in the back. I, none of this, it's, I mean, it was really nice hearing those things, but really they, they, our staff is what makes the Bureau right now. And um, I couldn't be more proud of them. And thank you for those comments because I, it means a lot to them too. It means a lot to us. Um, I, I'm just gonna say, people tell me all the time, I know everybody's clamoring and complaining and they say, don't take it personal, Lori. And how can I not take it personal? Because it's personal to you. And so it's for me, it has to be personal. I, but so I just want you to know that, and that's how the Bureau in general feels. Uh, so I think that's important for you to know, even if we don't agree on things, right? Yeah. So, uh, Thank you. but who do I ultimately report to? Or, um, you know, obviously it's the, the people of California, um, but, you know, also the, the administration, which is the governor's office. So um, I, I will always say I have many, many bosses. I don't think people understand. We have a hierarchy where we have the Bureau, we have the Department of Consumer Affairs, we have the, uh, our cabinet agency, Business Consumer Services and Housing, then the governor's office, and then of course the people. So um, it is can be challenging because you are striking that balance. and. Do we do that? We, tr we try, uh, but we know that, that it doesn't always, you know, I, sometimes I felt with the readoption of the emergency regulations, it's like, I don't think we made anybody happy. And it was like, oh my God, we really were trying to make people happy. But um, I think we struck some wins and maybe, you know, we missed the mark on some other things. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> There's some wind here. All right, thank you. So. You know, uh, as a CEO, you know, oftentimes your ship is kind of just in this ocean and you're trying to find out which direction to go. Uh, so oftentimes we have a North Star metric, something that we know that we can look at and say, all right, this is the success that we have or this is, the, this is where we're not, you know, meeting the bar. How do you look at success for us? How do you see, you know, this relative scale on where we're at and and how is it manifesting itself so far? Success is very difficult because I think it's it's different for everybody here what success is. I know from the state, I mean, it started two and a half years ago when we were just looking at implementing at that time the medical cannabis regulations and then it was both and then it was, oh, it's the July 1st deadline and then it's issuing licenses and now it's getting our final regs. So for us, it's been a series of small successes where we're meeting our deadline 
but in no way do I think, we, we haven't achieved success yet on the regulated market in cannabis. And I think um, because we're still figuring things out, I mean, it would be nice, and usually with success, you have a constant, like the North Star. I, we have no constant. It just keeps changing. And so it makes it very difficult to measure success. But um, I think when you look at our staff, you see how we care. We want to do the right thing. I think we've been successful in those areas. But again, I think we have so many people here and throughout California that are struggling to get into this regulated system, the ones that are, are being regulated are struggling to survive. So that's not success yet. But do I think we can achieve it? Yes. Um, do I have a timetable? No. Um, which is hard for all of you because you don't have a constant either because you're wondering what the next reg gonna, gonna look yeah. like, right? Yeah. How do you prepare as a business when you're not even sure what we're gonna put out there? So um, I, think, I, I, think we, I think getting through this year is going to be a big hurdle, and I hopefully then we'll have some constants where we can do a better job of measuring success. Yeah, I like that. Thank you. Uh, July 1, that seemed to be one of the most pressing topics that we, we crowdsourced here. Uh, it's two weeks away, and a, a lot of the goal of Meadowlands is kind of recalibrate, realign what we're here to get some clarity on how we move forward together. Um, you know, one of the biggest things that uh, we're hearing is the, the product that needs to be destroyed. Uh, how much value is there is undetermined, but it's a lot. And, you know, some people are asking, like, all right, is there a remediation process? Is there a, uh, an a avenue to donate to Compassion? You know, these are, yeah, these are areas that are, are really important to everybody, so... Yeah, give it back to the people. Um, you know, I don't know if you have thoughts on that or if there's a way we are open to that. So I'm going to call him out. I, I just had a conversation with Jared, a pretty, like, robust conversation on what the heck are you doing, Lori? Why aren't – we're not ready to transition and um, in some cases, he was telling me he thinks their stores with 60% of their product would have to go away. Yeah, we see that. And, and I told him, and I, I, I didn't think that. I'm like, I didn't realize that. I was thinking all along people are depleting their product. I thought we were getting to a place where, you know, we have the transition coming. And probably his most compelling argument to me was... I don't think we can get enough compliant product in the door by July 1st. Yeah. That's true. So, so here's the hard part. And I'm, I'm hearing this yesterday. And I said, we did, not put a trans, we did not extend the transition period in our emergency regulation. So as of July 1, well, there's no mechanism to change it at this point. And I said, I, I, I think we needed to hear this a, long t a while ago, and that's nobody's fault here. It was probably, we should have been asking the questions more instead of assuming like everybody's going along that line, because even he and I had a couple, a couple months ago, no, the transition period's not gonna get extended. So now we're faced with a couple of weeks from now, how do we what do we do? Um, what are some solutions? I, I, I hear giving it to a compassionate care program. Um, Budget trailer. Yeah, and, and then, but then you're at this, as the state, then we're looking at, well, that a lot of that product hasn't been tested. Is that, can we give that? Is that something uh, that the state is going to allow? We also have to look at, do we? Or do we look at, is there a way for the retailers to go backwards through the supply chain? Because if you see our, our, our transition period, uh, we, if you looked at our document that we came out, we do allow, if it's already, if, if the cultivator and manufacturer has title, they can put it through testing. So is there a way that we can put things backward through the supply chain without having track and trace? And I think uh, those are some hard conversations we've got to talk about very quickly uh, in the next couple of weeks. But I think it's not enough just to hear from a handful of people. 
I think we, you have to mobilize and talk to us, the lo your local representative, because I don't know that I can't, I, I told Jared, me alone can't just change and say, oh, you, we're not going to, you, you don't have to go by the regulations. So um, I would be, if, if you have other solutions out there that we can solve this, I, we're always open to hearing that. But um, I think uh, nobody was expecting from the numbers. I, I wasn't expecting those numbers. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we felt the same way. You know, one of those interesting things is you're, we're often running so fa fast to, you know, keep going forward, but there's still patches or things or cracks that haven't been uh, addressed. You know, one of the things about July 1 is the, the issue with tinctures. Um, you know, alcohol as an ingredient versus alcohol you know, as a resi residual solvent. And, um, you know, there's stuff like that that's just so, like, it's in there, but what people really rely on, that isn't, there isn't any clarification um, that kind of remediates that. Do you, how do you balance that forward and backward and keep moving that thing forward? We're, we're gonna take care of that issue. How about that? Great. Next. <laughs> Perfect. I All can't right. tell you like how and when, but it's, okay. it's we've heard you on that one. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate it. All right. So um, the next topic that was the, the third most pressing, uh, which you brought up, was track and trace. Yeah. And there's been a lack of transparency and communication from uh, Metric. We build software. We've been trying to get in touch with them. You know, at the retail level, when we implement point of sale systems, they're like, what about track and trace? And we're like, well... What about track and trace? Uh, you know, and you know, so far that we've gotten um, a lot of misinformation or assumptions. We think that's coming later this year, or we think it's coming next year, or you know, when do you think the first permanent cultivator receiving of their you know uh, of their RFID tag that goes into the ground that then will trickle down to the rest of the supply chain? Uh, you know, I love to hear. We'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah. <laughs> So everybody keeps saying there's some July 1 deal, that that's when Track and Trace is going to start. Well, and, and let me tell you, I, you know, we, are, we do rely heavily on Metric, who is a state contractor, but uh, they, are, they are responsible to the state to make sure this gets done and gets done right. Um, it is uh, uh, over uh, the uh, California Department of Food and Ag oversees Track and Trace, uh, but I think it's important to remember when when we ever we whenever we issue that first annual license, that's when Track and Trace that licensee is going to have to get into Track and Trace. So whenever that first cultivator license is issued, that will be the first cultivator to actually get the RFID tag and start tagging. So uh, when that'll be, it'll probably be very soon. And I, I think for most of us, we expected to have annuals really shortly start issuing shortly after the first round of temporaries expired. Uh, that didn't happen. And, and the reason for that is because we knew we had to fix the A&M separate licenses. Yeah, thank you for that. <laughs> that was huge. <Yeah. laughs> so uh, this was like in April, we said we got to do something. And I'm going to tell you, we felt very strong, uh, the three regulators, that we couldn't wait for the final regulations to put that change in because it wouldn't have been come effective until the end of the year. So we, we, we figured out we got to do it now, and we didn't want to start issuing annuals to A&M and having you pay the separate license fees. So we made the decision to put it, uh, I'm going to tell you, most state agency, if for readoption, they would have readopted the same old regs. Uh, they wouldn't have done the changes. We decided, let's put the change in. And I got to tell you this story. The biggest hurdle was not writing the, it was easy to write. It was the IT part of it. The reconfiguration to do the one license, then to merge all those temporaries, A and M's, all of that. And um, uh, Natasha was on our IT team. We brought our systems integrator, you'll appreciate that. And I said, this is what we wanna do. And he looked at me, I thought he was gonna get sick. He goes, <laughs> Like, what do you mean? Like, we're almost, we're coming to the end of the project. I go, we got to do this. And, he, and I go, how long do you think it'll take? He said, 
six months. And I looked at him and I go, you've got six weeks because this is getting done. And I think he was like, oh, my gosh, this lady's crazy because you have to be a little crazy to be in this. Okay. So we, it got done. As you, last weekend, it got done. Some of you may know the system went down. Everything went really well. So now we're in a position to issue those adult use licenses. So that was the delay. I think it was worth the delay. Plus, you got to operate longer on your temporary, which, heck, it's free still. So that's good. But I think you're going to find very soon we're going to start issuing those annuals. Those folks will get into track and trace. I think the the issue, though, is, is that you're going to still be, even those, those of you in track and trace, trace, you're going to still be dealing with temporaries that aren't in track and trace. And I think that's where we've got to get some good information out there. Because I'll be honest with you, it's confusing for me. Like, hey, what's the guy that's in track and trace going to do with the guy that doesn't have temporary? Lo- it's uh, So we're figuring it out. And as soon as we figure it out, it's like anything. If you don't hear anything from us, it's because we're trying to figure it out. And then we'll get it out to you. But I think we're not going to have a lot of meaningful data until we get more people licensed and more people in the system. So I think that's going to take some time over the next six months. Yeah, that's helpful in that clarity. Um, At Meta, we care a lot about harmony. And with all these different counties having different laws, with some that don't, some some do, do you have a, a way where we can create a little bit more alignment between state and local. And you know, are there mechanisms that can create incentive programs for locals to adopt certain things? Um, you know, Kat was saying they need funding. You know, uh, San Francisco needs funding. Uh, there's a need for capital. And you know, one of the things that we've been hearing about is, okay, can locals create alignment with the state that gets them the funding perhaps to implement things that keeps moving this thing forward. You know, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I I don't know that we have the funding right this right now. Um, And if you look at uh, that first quarter of tax revenues, um, you know, I think we're, we're also struggling to make, how how do we help cities and counties with funding? And I, I, I think we, I think, one, more cities and counties got to allow commercial cannabis activity. I mean, that's, and, and, and this is not here, and you know, it's not like, let's blame, even though it's, you know, but let's, you know, every, I, we're joking. It's like, everybody wants to blame the state and it's like, oh, okay, but we'll just blame the locals, you know? So it's this like circle, right? But, but of course that's, we, we've got to, I think that's first because we're not going to get more revenue with the state unless we can get more state licensees. So we first still have to get more cities and counties to allow commercial cannabis activity. And I think that has got to be our focus um, and then I think you work on the harmonization. And then as, as you get more people in, then you have more funding. But I, I think I agree with you. The state's got to do more to assist these cities and counties to get their operations uh, running. Yeah. Let's get mobilized. Uh, shifting gears to the, on delivery, this was uh, the number f- uh, four topic. There's a lot of uh, confusion about the implications of the changes to delivery regulations. Mostly, there's a lot of uncertainty about why the state decided to do this after the public comment period uh, with Section 54 and and on. Uh, Was this the result of lobbying, and does the industry need to increase lobbying efforts to affect the changes at once? Uh, You know, we mentioned earlier, is it the, the money that we have? It's a bigger voice. It's just a little bit of direction in how we can affect change uh, the most with the time that we have. So you saw that we came out with some delivery, new delivery language um, in the emergency regulations. Uh, it, it was a lot of us talking to the industry, really wanting the, the higher level, so going from the 3,000 to 10,000. Uh, we also felt that it was important that uh, you know, they have those orders prior from leaving uh, the delivery premises. And, and like so many of our regulations, when we put those out there, we got a lot of public comment. 
And we read those public comments and we listened and we talked. I mean, I have other people that I, 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 I have to respond to when we talk about what we're changing. And so we did make changes to it, hopefully trying to encourage more business, more delivery. Um, because we're looking at, we want delivery to work. And I know um, at a local level, it's, I mean, I think it's more difficult for them than it is for the state. Because when we look at delivery, wherever we license you, like if we license you in the city of Mendocino, that, that's where your hub is. That's where your records are. That's where your cannabis product is. But that allows you to go anywhere in the state to deliver. And I know that's hard for the, the cities and counties because... Some of them are banning it, um, and so that I think that's where the I think there is you know we've got the state has their look at delivery, and then you look at the locals and the cities and counties. But I think what we are trying to do is just listen to what we are hearing from some of these delivery companies and what they needed. Um, if we didn't strike that right balance, then yes, I think you do need to. I don't. I don't know that you need to go out and get a lobbyist, but we need to hear from you during these public comment periods because I think this is a perfect case of us reading those public comments and saying, "Hey, we didn't quite hit the mark on what we had the first time around," and that's. I'm going to tell you that's what you want from us. Do you want us to listen? But you you may say, I, I don't know that we're always going to make everybody happy. That's that's the hard part. So I don't know. I, I don't know where most of you are on the, the new delivery readoption. So yeah. not is that that's not very if you don't like them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. A good compromise. I, it's, it's a move forward. I think it was just we not having seen uh, the changes before anticipating them. I think that's why I was like, OK, well, how do we. You know, move how do you prepare? The, yeah, how do we prepare? We didn't right? prepare you we, for that one. At, at anybody. We're I like, know. okay, well, so we got that now. And, uh, uh, yeah. all right. And you didn't know it's coming. I mean, the game's totally changed. Yeah. Uh, it's insane. Um, <laughs> so we but, you know, it's just the way of the game. But, you know, it's it's just part of it. Yeah. So, and, and, and just so you know, we can't talk. I mean, we, we, we will take feedback at any point. And we can't talk about what's going to come out in our regs. And I think that's what's hard for everybody because you're not <laughs> hearing this ahead of time. It's just like, boom. Yeah. And, um, but it keeps you on your toes. See? You're like. <laughs> yeah. On my toes. Uh, <laughs> at my kitchen counter. Like, what is going on? Uh, okay. So the, this was the, the most uh, requested question and I think that everyone knows uh, or has thought about it there's an imbalance in the marketplace uh, between the illicit and the, the legal six months ago everyone was same you know playing field uh, now it's a little bit more you know infighting or they're they don't, they're not legal illicit you know, what's your what's your thoughts on how to rectify that but without recriminalization uh, or reprohibition, essentially, of like going after people that are are trying to move this thing forward, or, you know, enforcement is is a topic, but there may be other ways in putting people in, in jail. So we'd be here, right. happy to hear that. Uh, and that's what makes this uh, so complicated, because uh, I always say that we have different buckets, right? We have the legal market, the ones that are regulated. And then you have the obvious ones that are never going to get regulated. But then in between, we still have the collective cooperative model that's in effect until January 9th of next year. And then we have these other people that are trying to get licensed with the local uh, jurisdiction, just can't yet. They've got their application in, but they're really trying to follow whatever they can to make sure to get licensed. And so you have all these buckets and then, and, and then you have your enforcement people that start coming in and it's making sure you communicate to them what is our going to be our priority because we got to prioritize because there's so, I mean, it's, I mean, it, it is over, it, it's overwhelming. I, I'll tell you of, of the complaints we get on our complaint, uh, on our BCC online complaint, I think we have over 600, 80% of them is on unlicensed activity. So, you know, it's a lot. So, 
you know, we start off, well, you know, you, we, you've heard me, we started off with let's educate people. Let's make sure they understand that, like, if they're advertising for, you know, commercial cannabis and they're having adult people come in and buy, that's commercial cannabis activity. They need to be licensed. And, you know, that worked for some of the people like, oh, okay, I got to get licensed. How do I do that? Um, for some of them, they just don't even want to talk to us. So we, and we've followed up with many phone calls. I, I think I've told you guys, uh, you know, some people are very happy to hear from us saying, hey, we were waiting for you to call me, which I think that's interesting. They're waiting for the bureau to call them to tell them you got to get licensed. But hey, if that's what it takes, we'll call them. And then um, <laughs> call all of them. Um, and then others just hung, hang up like, oh, gosh, immediately. Uh, so... <laughs> So for us, uh, we're right now, um, we're, we have our, our uh, the Bureau has enforcement crew that are going out and, you know, of course we're going out to the licensed retailers. We've probably visited some of your folks and we get great information from you on who's out there. But again, I'm hearing complaints like, well, you're keeping us in line. You're making sure everything, what are you doing about that black market? And so that's what's the tough part. You know, there's, you know, there's the political end. We've got to make sure that our licensees are complying because we want to make sure this works, right? And, and you don't want someone who's, you know, creating, you know, issues for the community or whatnot. But on the other hand, you're following the rules, and here's this activity just still going on rampant. So uh, we do now have, uh, through uh, the Department of Consumer Affairs, we have a cannabis enforcement unit, and we have sworn officers. And we are making sure, as we refer complaints to them, we're prioritizing those complaints on who needs to, you know, have enforcement action because we are moving into that next phase. I think we always still educate wherever we can, but we're moving into that uh, next phase of Swiss and Swiss, Swiss, Swiss cheese, Swift enforcement. Sorry. Um, <laughs> so, um, so I think that's where we're at. And then a lot of it does come with working with the locals because we, I think it's important that we talk to Nicole and Joe and Kat and say, hey, here's who we're looking at to go after. Are they in agreement? Are these people that are trying to get licensed? So I think it's different than any enforcement that I've been around because as most of you know, I regulated alcohol for 22 years. I was a law enforcement officer for 22 years. And it wasn't that, there wasn't all these different buckets. It was like, if you had an illegal still, you had an illegal still. You weren't in the regulated market. It was easy. Um, this isn't quite so easy. But I, I know for all of you here, uh, you're struggling to do the right thing. And it's really hard. Being, I, I said this, being a pioneer in this is, has not been easy at all, because uh, you're the ones struggling right now, so. Yeah. <laughs> you are. So, uh, we had some questions that kind of just asked the, the operators how they're doing. And um, on profitability, we asked, are you less profitable, more profitable, uh, or the same? 88% are in less or the same. Only 12% making more. We asked, uh, are you hiring? Yes, no, or just frozen. 83% are not hiring or frozen. 17% um, were downsizing, uh, which is interesting. And then we asked about, uh, do you believe medical is still viable? And 55% said no. And, you know, Transitioning from this topic of enforcement, another way to help operators is to make them more competitive in the marketplace. Um, economics work, and the a big concern is taxes. And you know, you have a, a really good handle on what tax revenues come in to fund what you're doing. Uh, we need to figure out how to get more licenses to get the taxes to get <laughs> and the application fees. It's this this catch twenty two. Um, you know, I I'm sure you've heard, if not, taxes are a huge burden. Uh, you look at the excise tax, you have the 60%, you have the bill that Bont is pushing in to put down 11%, but the CDTFA still has the ability of making that 60% markup 100% if they wanted to, and then bring it back to where, where we were. And then you have the confusion around local taxes and sales tax, non-exemptable taxes, taxes that taxes other taxes. <laughs> 
right? <laughs> like your, your sales tax needs to tax the excise tax and needs to tax the, uh, the local tax. But if you're in San Diego, they're saying you, the local tax doesn't tax the excise tax. And then you're like, okay, well, but if I buy a grinder in San Diego and I have to pay the sales tax, I'm a medical patient, I buy some cannabis and then it's, it's crazy. <laughs> And it's all in cash, right? And so, you know, maybe it's not about, uh, so we'd love to hear your thoughts on sort of uh, helping create economic competitiveness uh, through either lower taxes or other mechanisms. Uh, hope, I'm hoping that you've had conversations that you can share with us and, you know, maybe they're not solutions, but maybe they're just like things you're, you're discussing. So I, I really had high hopes for that Bonta bill because um, I, I did feel there needs to be some relief here. Um, I, I think there's got to be taxes. It, it was in Prop 64. I, I just I don't think any of us realize what that impact would be. But I think for me, when I look at just figuring out the excise tax and the cost of goods and how that is, I, I'm going to tell you all here, I couldn't figure it out. And... When you talk about the local tax and what it's on, if it's net revenue, gross revenue, and if we're going to make it... Non-arms length. Yeah, non-arms non -arms length. Arms I don't length. even get that. Um, <laughs> so if that's... If even I go, gosh, this is hard to figure out, it's like anything else. If it's going to be hard to figure out, it's like your, your, your state income tax, your federal income tax, you're not going to... Either you're just not going to do it because it's too complicated or you're just gonna put anything down, or it's not gonna be done right. So I think if we can't simplify this, and then on top of that, it's all cash, and it's hard to get your cash to the taxing authorities. They make it difficult to give you them, you're here you wanna give them your cash, and I'm hearing it's difficult to do that. So I, I think I look at some of these, the first quarter is probably just people are like, God, this is just too hard. And, I, and I'll be honest, I can be a procrastinator and I'd be one of those ones that would wait to the last minute and like, oh gosh, this is too much, forget it. Yeah. And, and that's not the right way to be, I get it. But I think, so I think it's twofold. Can we find relief for you? And then how can we make it easier for you to pay your taxes? But you know, when you look at those numbers, I think I'm concerned about like the hiring and downsizing. That's probably, I think, out of those, those are the scariest numbers right there because how, and if we can't do it through taxes, lowering it because, you know, it's very difficult because it was a Prop 64, then how, do, how can we do it in other ways to make sure that you're putting money into your business and have that money to put into your business so you can expand and grow? Yeah, there's, um, there's that piece. There's also, you know, one of the costs that everyone's dealing with is compliance. And uh, a fair amount of us spend a lot of time and money paying lawyers, accountants, more lawyers, the lawyers, advisors, consultant. Um, and it's a lot of it's because we don't know if we're asking the right questions or we're getting clarification on something. And one of the solutions that we were thinking about, you know, a lot of this, uh, the, the Q&A that you guys are, don't worry about that, uh, the Q&A, huh? there's some secrets on there. <laughs> it's not a secret, it's totally, it's totally cool. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, it was a note that was passed to me, but it's all good. The, um, you know, you have this idea of uh, fluid information and I'm sure you guys get a lot of questions at the same thing over and over and over again. It'd be great to have some sort of forum or a database or a repository, even a spreadsheet of here are all the questions that were asked, here are the answers, instead of filing a Freedom of Information Act every single time. And because you know, a lot of us were so in our own, own lane and that when you're trying to understand who you're trying to work with and what they have to go through and vet them out, you're asking different questions that you're not anticipating. And so you know, how do we lower the compliance barrier of information? How do we get this stuff out where we're not paying $450 for an hour of time for a lawyer to tell me that, uh, no offense to lawyers, I love you guys, <laughs> all right? Just saying, I'm not trying to call you out. I'm just saying you guys cost a lot of money. 
and we're, we're trying to make this economically viable, okay? Um, but that's just something, you know, maybe it's not taxes, maybe it's like that. So I'd love to hear your thoughts and maybe how we change the balance sheet a little bit for us operators and where we can allocate funds or, yeah. I, I, you know, I am going to be the first ones that, uh, that I would have, in the beginning I said, I don't want our regs so difficult that people would have to hire outside con con consultants or attorneys just to figure out. That's like... Uh, who here hires an outside consultant or yeah. attorney? All right, here we go. Yeah. It's, it's a lot of language. Yeah. <laughs> so I was reading your... You had that in your... Uh, what you sent to me uh, yesterday, and I was reading that and said, wow, what a simple idea, yet, um, and probably easy to implement, yet we, like, you, had, you, you telling me that goes, oh, yeah, we could do a spreadsheet like that. We could easily do that. And you guys are probably thinking, what a, you know, I am a blonde, right? So, yeah. <laughs> so... Um, <laughs> So I think we absolutely can do that because one of the reasons you saw a lot of clarification language in the regs were based on all those emails we get from BCC. And some of them, we just keep getting the same one, the same one, and we realize, wow, that's not clear in the regs. So we cleared it up. But there is no reason we can't put those answers out for everybody. And in fact, we are so serious about, our, we send everybody to that BCC email and I still have dedicated staff that are answering those, usually legal staff, or that so we give you consistent, correct answer. I just don't want it going everywhere in the bureau and somebody saying one thing and you call someone else and they say another. So I, we absolutely can do that. And I, 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 I yes. that'd be great. I, I always yes. say, I told Jared this, don't assume we're thinking of all this stuff because we're so focused on getting certain things. Sometimes it's the little stuff escapes you. So. Yeah. Well, you know. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, uh, yes. Yes, that is. Yes. Um, so, you know, we have a handful of more questions here. Uh, one of them was around is there going to be an emergency regulations 3.0? Uh, or is it going to be, you know, uh, permanent regulations coming? And do you anticipate that coming soon, later? How long do we have these emergency regulations 2.0? And, you know, will there be another process of public comment? Like, how much time do we have mobilized to get to the next permanent or emergency? Or you gotta start mobilizing now. Yeah. Okay. Like after yeah. Yeah. Well. Yeah. We're yeah. We're trying to understand the timeline. So uh, there is gonna emergency. There is no emergency regulations 3.0. Uh, at the end of this 180 days, we have no ability to extend them any longer. And if we don't get our permanent regs, uh, there would be no regs. Which I always say, you guys would probably love that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> So after this 180 days, they do go away. We have no ability to extend them. So that's why you're going to probably see in the next couple of weeks uh, us releasing our final regulations. Uh, that'll kick off a 45-day comment period. It's not the same as emergency. 45-day comment period. Uh, where you can respond. We're going to do reg hearings. And then we look at all the, the comments. We have to respond. We're required through, through the California rulemaking process to respond. We don't have to during emergency, but during regular we do. And then if we make any changes, unlike emergency regs, where we could make changes during that 10-day period after comment, during regular rulemaking, we have to notice the public again. And, and it's based on if it's substantial changes and it's another 45 days. If it's not substantial, it's more technical cleanup, it's a 15 days. So this process is very transparent. Uh, and so, and, and we're running out of time. We have 180 days to get this done. And so you're gonna see that very soon. So I would suggest if there's things you wanna see, it's time, it's time to mobilize. There you go. All right, you heard that. Okay, what keeps you up at night? Because I, I don't know how everybody's sleeping nowadays, but what keeps you up at night? 
Everything, everything, everything. I do not, I do not sleep well anymore. And I've heard you have something for that. Yeah, <laughs> we do. We do. Yeah. One yeah. someday. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I, I, it really everything. I just want you to know our, our, and that's just just not me. Our, my mind is running all the time. I wake up in the middle of the night and I say, "Oh gosh, we got to do this. I got to do this." I feel like, you know, at the bureau, we're just riding by the seat of our pants every day and so and it's every day we're this is we're here it's seven days a week it doesn't go away but that's that's a good you know what I can rest later it's just like you guys you guys are you guys are the same thing I'm sure there's a lot of things that keep you up at night um, on how you're going to make it the next day so and I just say we can rest later we got a lot of work to still get done yeah um, yeah thank you we uh we appreciate it and by the way, this is the most relaxed I've been in a long, long time. Yeah, nature. Yeah. That's great. I, I, I've never smiled this much and so much because it's just so nice. And who would have thought, like, we were talking about it three yeah. years ago, I'd be sitting here with people just smoking cannabis, and it's, like, so normal. So like, normal. This is what we do. It's just that these hotels don't allow us to. Right? We're really good people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we're we're making a, a lot of progress here. Um, you know, we've gone through over half uh, the questions so far, and so I, I think we might even have a little bit of time of Q and A. So if you have some questions, we we'll, might have a, a couple. We'll call and just prepare them in your mind as uh, we go through, and you know, keep it classy, right? All right. All right. So. Uh, there's concern that there's not enough licenses that have been issued for retail, especially uh, delivery. Uh, we went from you know a couple thousand, maybe more, of delivery operators to I think a hundred that have been licensed. Uh, there's also a concern of potential oversupply on the cultivation side, especially due to license stacking and the removal of the one-acre cap. Uh, it's hurting a lot of people. You know, what are you doing or thoughts that you have on addressing? You know, keeping small operators from being eliminated by a constricted supply chain. Uh, we care deeply about the small business, small craft, the grower that has been doing this a while, or even the small mom and pop delivery operator that has been serving their collective for eight years. Um, and many of the patients now don't have access or have to drive far away. And it, it's really a shame. Um, so I'd love to hear your, your thoughts on the, uh, getting more licenses. So I, I, I'm going to tell you, we need more of every license type, not just retail. Um, and then, uh, of course, there's a worry. Uh, you know, we, we even look at retailers, you know, how many, you know, how many licenses one person has and whatnot. And I think, with, I think it, it really is the cultivate, at the cultivation level that you start looking at, like, I, 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 don't, I think I've lost count, over 70 to the same uh, business yeah. down in the Santa Barbara area. Oh, Absolutely. And and I don't I think we all look at gosh um, like wow wow that happened pretty quick and really and what is that doing to the small grower it's probably really really hurting you and so you I mean we d the bureau does not oversee cultivation uh, so this is something and I'm sure all of you that's where you really do need to mobilize right and making sure that we're interpreting the statute the way I think it was meant what you passed in Prop 64. And so I think that is making sure you are talking to the regulator, talking to CDFA, um, and also your legislators in your area, because um, they've got to hear from you and they've got to understand how it's hurting you. So I think we're, we're, we're learning as we go. And, and I know that's, that's no excuse because as, as small business say, we can't do this anymore. It's not enough to say, well, learn faster state learn faster but i think i think there are certain things that we can work together to get done to make sure we strike a balance because i'm going to say i think there's room for everybody because as a state i think there's room for the small the medium and the large but it's striking that balance and i'm not sure we're we're there um, but at the same time, we know we've got to issue a lot of licenses. So there's this, there's that balance. We know we need to get more people in the supply chain. We know that, 
if you're a cultivator, we need more retailers for you to sell your product to. So the, it, it is a sort of a back and forth on how we strike that balance. And I think it's going to be a lot of you are going to have the ideas on how we make this happen because we don't, I don't want to see the small grower. I mean, look at you come up here. What a beautiful life this is if you're a small grower up here. I mean, we want to preserve that. And, and I'm going to tell you, being a cultivator. <laughs> and some retailers may disagree with me. Being getting licensed as a cultivator is very difficult and all the different agencies you have to intersect with. So is there a a way to consolidate that? And I'm going to tell you look at the alcohol model for grape growers. Look at beer manufacturers and where, how they grow their hops. And I think really as a group, you need to start looking at that model and how that works and talking to your, your state representatives. Yeah. Uh, there is a huge supply of working capital and financial resources available to us. The industry desperately needs access to banking. Has there been any movement or, you know, what's going on and conversations that are happening? So there's a lot of conversations going on, as you know. There's from the state treasurer to the business oversight that oversights all the banks. Um, and, and really, I think there, we thought there was, gonna, there was movement towards the end of the year. Uh, when, the, when the federal government rescinded the coal memo in early January, I think it really just banks that were ready to do it just sort of pulled back. Uh, and, and that was disappointing. Uh, there is a, Senator Hertzberg has a, a bill out uh, for a, for a banking, so, you know, a semi-public bank, uh, and and it'll be interesting to see how that develops. Um, I just think a lot of it, really, the the being uh, federally illegal is just really makes it really tough on the banking, as all of you know. It's just, uh, how do we get, how do we do it just as a state alone? Um, and, you know, you've looked at, you know, Colorado and Oregon and Washington, everybody's trying to, trying to figure out the solution. So I think it's mobilizing with our other sister states. Um, I think there's got to be some movement on the federal level. And then, you know, seeing how we can get these smaller banks to bank you. I mean, I'm going to tell you, I, 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 I'm, this is, uh, you're going to find this interesting uh, because you probably think, well, I don't, you don't know how, you don't know how we feel, but I'm going to tell you when we were, we moved our, our, our operations from, we were at under DCA, we have a, a, a now a new facility in Rancho Cordova, which is just outside of Sacramento. And we, we, they knew who were, was coming in when they rented to us, a private building owner. It got to be when we were doing the, the signage for our, our, our bureau, uh, the landlord said, you cannot put Bureau of Cannabis Control. I'm like, what are you, what are you talking about? Um, they said, you can put Department of Consumer Affairs, but you can't put anything cannabis. Not on front, not here. And, and, and the reason why is because they were f afraid if when they wanted to sell the building, they were afraid it would uh, discourage buyers from wanting to, you know, buy the building. And I know this is a small example of what you go through every day, but it was like, oh, hell no. We're, we're the, I'm sorry, but it's legal now. Like, we're having our name out there. Um, so, so it says the Bureau of Cannabis Control in several places um, highlighted. All right. But that's just one example, and that was from us at the state where we find this, like, discrimination because you're in cannabis. And so, you know, I hope that we can solve a problem. I want to tell you, we're, we've, we're going to take your cash, by the way. We'll take your cash. So we're taking your cash. And then, by the way, we are opening an office up north on July 2nd, and we'll take your cash up there, too. <laughs> In Eureka. Did your landlord raise the rent on you three times? Yes. Yes. Yeah? Yes. Yeah. All right. Just saying. It's like... Well, not three times, yeah. but up in Eureka, yeah. Yeah, as soon as they like, knew yeah. what we were doing, it's like, oh, now it's... Well, we you had got a, the monies. Yeah. Let's, let's raise the rent. Yeah. Uh, so I have a, a couple more questions. These are pretty light, and then we'll have some time for some QA. So we're crushing. Okay. 
Yeah, good job. Um, this is for the manufacturers. Uh, will you ever revisit the edibles dosage limitation? Edibles limited to 10 milligrams of serving is in SB94, but 100 milligrams per package is not in law and could be removed, at least for products marked for uh, medical use only. That is under the Department of Public Health. See, you need, see everything needs to just, I know. So I, um, so we, the Bureau does not have control over that. It, that does fall under the Department of Public Health, and so they do need to hear from you. Um, and it's, it is hard for the Bureau to, you know, we're the lead agency, but we don't tell other agencies what to do, especially when it comes to, like, public health issues. We're, that is not our expertise. Um, we're, we're gaining more expertise with the laboratories and things, but things of that nature, that would be something to really... Uh, yeah, Got I it. know. Uh, will the BCC consider pushing for no cannabis taxes on CBD-only products that contain no THC? So we don't regulate uh, the CBD products that don't have cool. no THC, but you've probably gotten a... If you anybody have asked uh, whether retailers can sell that product, have you, have you seen our answer? No. We've said you cannot sell that product in your retail premises. Why? Because we, we need to figure out a way to get that regulated through the normal supply chain using people that are in that supply chain because I really feel all these products really directly compete with what you're doing. Um, and so I think we do need to have a big conversation about these CBD products, where they're derived from, what's in them before. Where is it derived from, right? Huge. And that's, maybe that's at some point up. we regulate it so everybody in the world isn't out there putting it out there because we don't know what's in a lot of these products. Yeah. Great. I mean, that's like my questions. Like, fantastic job on that. We have 10 more minutes. Uh, so we'll do some Q&A if that's possible. Okay, I'll, I'll repeat the question. As a cultivator in Oakland dealing with local regulators, uh, you also have the the pleasure of dealing with the Department of Building and Planning and Department of Fire and Department of everybody. And no one's talking to each other. Is there a way to create a, a more alignment to enable uh, less conversations between all these multiple regulatory groups? How do we educate the local regulators? Yep. Uh, and this is something the Department of Public Health has talked about, and I think that is their goal to get some guidelines out there because they're finding that even uh, when they're starting to do their site inspections, even of, of uh, CO2, play, CO2 rooms where they're going that have been licensed by the locals, they're even finding some issues that because they just don't know. And so they found some very serious issues. So they, they understand they got to have some guidance out there because there's just a lot of people that just don't know. And so excellent point. And I do think you're going to see some guidance coming out. Um, probably once we get these uh, regulations out the door, you're going to start seeing more of that. I, I, something that's really important to this industry is um, we're all putting a lot of money and a lot of effort into this. And it's important for us to have mechanisms to bring in investments without bringing businesses to halt. And so some of those mechanisms require us to leverage um, some equity. And so the Bureau has the ability to create license types that are necessary. And so the idea, and you said mention ideas if we come up with them, right? And um, so the idea of having almost like a, an accredited cannabis investor that fast tracks and allows you to negotiate and bring funding in without delaying and stopping the business operations so that we know, hey, and this isn't, it's not mandatory, but if we took funding or some of these people came onto the cap table for some liquidity for the business to grow, uh, not halt that business, allow it to keep expanding at a certain rate because, hey, these are already pre-accredited, they met whatever requirements, and they can fit on the ownership table. Is that something you can consider? Thank you. Thank, you know, I, and I'm not, a, I'm, I'm not a financial person, but I, you're intriguing me with that. I, I would like to hear more and put you probably in touch with some of our folks that are legal folks that we could talk to. I, I'm not sure exactly how that would work, but... I would be very interested because I'm sort of interested of where you think that's halting at getting licensed, uh, why that's, uh, maybe if you could just expand on that. 
So as soon as um, you accept capital, and if it, it wasn't through debt, um, the you know, and they actually became owners and took an equity position, your business now has to freeze. Got it. I got it. Got it. Yes. I think we can work on that. Yes. And finding a way that you can continue to operate until they get qualified. Yes. I think we can work on that. Yes. Hi, Lori. I just want to thank you so much for being so accessible to us and for coming here and answering our questions. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we really appreciate that. Uh, are you concerned about the amount of plastic that's being introduced to the industry? And please, we need to talk about this as a community and if there's anything you can do in the final regs that would reduce the amount of plastic coming into the supply chain, the earth will thank you. The plastic is honestly more harmful than the cannabis. It is. And a lot of the packaging requirements is in statute and but we, we hear this a lot. Uh, so I think even with, you know, maybe being more, uh, with, even with our exit packaging and not, I mean, I think everybody thinks that it has to be plastic. I don't think it necessarily, you know, it doesn't have to be. And so maybe it's just even the little that we have control of, I think we can do a better job on that. But I do think when it comes to all the packaging, some of that is going to have to be dealt with with a change in uh, statute. As part of your education and outreach efforts, how about having an event for local officials and talk about co you know, enforcement and funding and all the different things and to help them get over it. Um, secondly, <laughs> get on the plan, yeah. Um, secondly, I've been getting complaints at Cal Normal about, well, when I go into the adult shop, I have to give them all this information about myself. Like, why isn't it just like a bar and I can just go in and use it? And I think that that has hampered the program as far as being successful in the first rollout. And I wonder, I, I've, I've gotten conflicting responses as to whether, you know, like once it's track and trace, is it because you have to keep people to one ounce at any location in a day? Or are you going to have to keep that? I think that's something we need to get rid of. So to address the, the local issue, uh, one of the things that we've, we've put in, uh, so our budget, we, we put in for our budget for this next fiscal year, which starts on July 1st, we're waiting. Um, it, it, it's, it's not, hasn't been finally approved, but we did put in a unit, just a local liaison unit. Uh, we feel the need to really have uh, people that are dedicated to the local jurisdiction in certain areas and they just have somebody they can contact and then they would also be responsible for setting up regional trainings in the area for those locals and then also assisting people with their application. So these people would be dedicated to anybody here that, so you don't have to hire a consultant or an attorney so we can walk you through the state process and then put you in touch with who to go through in the local. So I think that's going to help. I mean, obviously, once we get the money, then we staff up. And so that's going to help a lot in that issue. And are those staff people like listed on your website? So if you're in a region, you can refer people to them? Or? They, they haven't been hired yet because they're not in our budget yet. But starting July 1, so you're going to have to give us a few months to hire the people to get there. And then you got to train them. You know, how this is, gets... Um, and then I go, uh, the, the, taking information yes. about people. Yeah. So I, I, I think in our regs right now, we require like a, a first name or they can assign a customer number. But then on the receipt, they have to show what cannabis was bought and all of that. Um, a, a lot of, you know, I think we need to probably look at the statute and our regs. And if you think that's too onerous for people here to give that information, um, I, I think I think we're, I, I think you're right. We want to look at someday looking at this, you know, other than seeing your ID to make sure you're old enough to buy the product, like in alcohol, do we really need all that rest of that information? I think it's also hard to, uh, to track whether people are going from one retail to the other and going over the, the daily limit. I'm not sure that we can ever really successfully track that or enforce that. I mean, uh, so. Nobody's going to go pay retail an ounce, an ounce, an ounce here and then take it to the black market. Yeah. That's just not financially. Yeah. <laughs> okay. There you go. <laughs> right. Great question. Thanks, Good Ellen. Uh, thanks, Dave, for running this panel, and thanks, Lori, for being here. Uh, many of our NorCal farms have worked hard for these last couple of years to prepare for the July 1 deadline, and we have clean, compliant product ready to go to the market. Is there any consideration that you're thinking about changes to the July 1 requirements? And if so, can you 
uh, educate us on that so we can be prepared for any changes? So as I spoke earlier, like right now, the July 1 transition period, I mean, as of June 30th, that transition period go, goes away, and then we move into that second phase of the testing requirements. So as most of you know, we didn't require all of the required testing at the beginning. We had a phased-in approach. So January 1, you had to do a certain amount of testing, required testing. July 1 is phase 2. And then uh, phase three starts the beginning of next year. So that's still ready to go. The, the, uh, I'm going to tell you that I don't, the testing's not going to change. That's going to come into play on, on July 1. And one of the things that obviously we're going to be talking about pretty heavily in the next couple of weeks is, if, is there a way to do something with all that product at retail? So. Very good. Thank you. Great. The tax bill was not able to go through because it was not revenue neutral. There are other proposals that would potentially create a revenue neutral taxation uh, situation similar to what we have for income tax, right? Uh, is that something that you would support either on the cultivation or the excise? So when it comes to any kind of legislation or bills, I'm going to tell you, I, I am not, in my position, I'm, appoint, I'm an appointee of the Brown administration, and um, I all say this, we're not allowed to take positions on bills unless we're told we're going to take, unless we're told what that position is. So, but I'm going to say the administration as a whole is, is, has always, are, I've always been very open to ideas to support the industry to make sure they're successful. So even though we can't come out and support any certain bill or all we can provide is technical assistance, we, and which we do uh, quite a bit. And so in the sense that overall, do we want to do things that are going to be six, that make the red gig market successful? Of course, that's what we want because if, if, if you're not successful, the state has failed, right? And so... That's about as far as I can go on that. Brian again, coming on up. Thank you for my second question. I hear you say that you want to increase the number of permitted operations and, and dole out annual permits you know, as soon as possible to get people on board with the track and trace. With that being said, how, what's your position on local municipalities that are withholding general applicant approval in favor of those who have the resources and means to incubate? You know, there, I mean, let's, there's 480, what, 83 cities and 58 counties. So it's hard. I, I can't comment on any one city or county and exactly what they're doing at that time. What we do is provide them whatever resources they need from us, really making sure we're at least telling them where we're at in the process, educating them on our regulations. Because I'm going to tell you a lot of the, and I'm not talking of the ones that have their comprehensive program in place. They're all squared away, but there's a lot of jurisdictions that are trying to figure this all out just the way you guys are trying to figure out our regs. And we find there's so much education that still needs to be done from us to them because there's a lot of rumors that get started in this industry. I think that's, you know, if I'm going to take away anything, boy, please just send us an email when you hear stuff because it just goes like, completely viral and you're like where did that come from so uh, so that's really our focus with the locals is making sure we're getting them good information and also having a good program in place so we can say hey look at we're it's working for us my question is about cannabis tourism and how it can support this industry as a whole. Uh, I run Emerald Farm Tours, and I get calls almost weekly from licensed uh, farmers up here in Mendocino and Humboldt County who are begging me to bring people up to their farm for ecotourism experiences. Now, my question is, when and how soon can we see guidance around tasting rooms, around consumption facilities and what they what those what those regulations will look like it's work it's working really well in san francisco um maybe if that could be your model could we get could we get like some some timeline on that Consumption's allowed at the if you have a retail license, and that is really uh, that's the locals. Uh, if the locals allow consumption, then we don't really have a say in whether they can or can't do it. So that is really at the local level. When it comes to like tasting rooms, and and obviously we're talking about cultivation or maybe even manufacturing. I don't know. Um, that would have to be a change in legislation. And, and, and again, you, you, can, you can look at the alcohol model when you look at wine, wineries and breweries and how they're, they're fully vertical. One license they can sell to 
uh, uh, wholesale. Yeah. They can sell to distributors, retailers, and the consumers. But there's some restrictions on what they can do. So I think those are things you got to start looking at. And but keep in mind also, it, it, the alcohol industry didn't get all these privileges overnight. For a long time, there was a lot of the bigger guys, the smaller guys, had to get those privileges. It took many, many years to get some of the same privileges that the big guys have. But I think those are some things we need to start talking about. Uh, somebody, I don't know if he's here, I was down in LA and somebody was talking about a tourism bus of allowing people to, you know, consume on a bus that goes around. I think we've got to look at all of those things. Uh, I mean, maybe not right now, I know, maybe not. But My but attorneys I, are looking into it for sure. Yeah. So I think there's a lot, because we got to figure, there's so many people that are coming to California and want, we want them to have a good experience here. And how do we make it more of a good experience? Um, so I think those are, uh, those are conversations that are going to have to be had, but a lot of that's going to have to be changed at, in statute. Thank you so much. Hey, what about that panel? Yeah. Yeah. That was really, really, really good. I had a great time. Yeah. Your peoples. <laughs> yeah. You guys are so, so, so beautiful. Thank you, thank you, thank you.